It's Wednesday night, and we are in a study on the Charismatics. The Charismatics are truly some of the most devious, underhanded, false teachers in the world. They are those people that teach that you can have what you want by saying positive words. They call that positive confession, and their enemies have renamed it, name it, and claim it, and they've latched on to that. They even laugh about it when they say, we believe in name it and claim it. They believe that you have positive vibrations that go out of your mouth, and that you can cause things to be simply by your words. Now, <coughs> they use verses like, uh, like Mark 11, 23, If you'll say to this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. And they redefine what a mountain is. Well, a mountain was the capital city of an empire. And they call a mountain a, a pile of bills in the distance, or their house note, and they say, you can say, uh, be paid for, and the house will be paid for. You can say the name of the car you want. You can say town car, town car, I get a town car, I get a town car with gold trim on it, with a gold grill in it, and with gold wheels on it. I get a town car, I get a town car. And they believe if you say that that way, that you will get that. You say, you, all you have to do is claim it, and it's yours. Well, that's not what the Bible's talking about. If you'll say to this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. I said it last week. Jesus had just cursed a fig tree. It was against Jewish law to kill fig trees <coughs> unless it was five years old or older, not bearing fruit, according to Leviticus, the 19th chapter and the 20th chapter of Deuteronomy, those last two verses. Well, Jesus tells John, Peter and John, have faith in God. I'm God. I know. I know how old the fig tree is. And what you do when you get involved in a mountain, Babylon was the mother of all idolatry, the mother of harlots. She was founded upon self. Let us make us a name. There's two mountains in the Bible that are battling, Babylon and Zion. Zion is the mountain where Jerusalem sits, and we are come to Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, the church. Now, they have twisted the word of God. They actually say that they can bind the devil by saying, we bind you, Satan. And of course, bind, uh, whatsoever you bind on earth be bound in heaven, whatsoever you loose on earth be loosed in heaven. Of course, heaven and earth, heaven and earth, that is an old ancient term, that is an idiom, you look up heavens in your McClinic and Strong, and it'll have a section on heaven and earth. It'll even start off saying heavens were governments. That's what they'll start the article saying. That heavens was government, it was what ruled people. Ruled. And the earth was, these were the rulers. Heavens was the rulers. And the earth was the ruled. And when, when the scripture says in Isaiah 65 that I'll create new heavens, new heavens and new earth, and he says the former things will pass away and I'll have new heavens. In other words, the new heavens will be a new Israel, new Israel, and that will be spiritual Israel, the church. The church. When you find the new heavens and new earth in the twenty first chapter of Revelation, when you find that, it's talk I John saw heavenly Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. I saw new heaven and new earth. Well that's talking about the new birth. That's not talking about a literal city coming down. That's that's talking about a new birth because the new heavens is the Gentile Israel spiritual Israel, the church. And that's what, in fact, when you read the entire context of Isaiah 65, God is talking about destroying Israel, and the reason they were the heavens, they could conquer all their enemies. They ruled the world. The, God says in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, if you will keep my commandments and obey me, 
then you'll go against your enemy one way and they will flee seven ways. That means that makes them the heavens when they go against their enemies and conquer them. Now we go against our enemies and we conquer them and that's called binding and loosing. Bind and loose. Bind and loose has to do with the heavens. It has to do with Israel and how we are ruling people. Now I'm going to kind of finish up last week and then go into a new subject all in the same uh, lesson here. Now, we bind and we loose there in that 18th chapter of Matthew. If you have ought against your brother, go to your brother and tell him your complaint. And then if he repent, you've gained your brother. If he will not repent, then you take two or three more witnesses that way but make sure that your accusations are true and that the witnesses are verifying what you're saying because they were privy to the infraction. Make sure of that. Now, binding and loosing has to do with the heavens because it says whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Well, the heavens is the church, spiritual Israel. And we bind and loose with two witnesses, two to three witnesses. When somebody's a witness, they have to verify that they saw what you saw or heard what you heard. You can't just go out and recruit a witness and say, will you be my witness? That's not good enough. If uh, you get two witnesses, you've got to have, if you see the man shoot the guy, you got to go find two other guys that saw this shooting take place. That's the way you're a witness. Not, hey, will you be my witness and will you be my witnesses? No. They have to know the infraction. That's the way you've got two witnesses. Well, we have two witnesses, and all through the Bible, when you go to the Old Testament, two witnesses is, is the, this is how you bind. Bind means to forbid. This was a, Rabbi's term, bind and loose. You have to do that. That means, bind, D-O means to forbid or to declare guilty. Declare guilty or and loose, luo. Luo means to permit. And it doesn't mean to forbid people. It doesn't mean to permit people or innocent. It means to declare guilty or innocent, and that's the same thing as judging. And when you judge, crino is the word judge. Crino means to decide guilty or innocent but you've got to have two witnesses that saw the sin or heard the sin you have to have that involved now this is about binding and loosing permitting or forbidding or declaring unlawful that would be bind, or lawful. Now, I'm going to finish up what we started last week. Declaring lawful or unlawful is deciding guilt. And the problem is, most people don't understand that deciding innocent is also in there. People say, don't judge him. And what they mean is, let him be innocent. If you declare somebody innocent or guilty without two to three witnesses that have seen the infraction, then you're guilty. Now, or heard the infraction, they have to know that. Now, we're talking about binding, which is forbidding guilty 
This is a legal term, and I'm talking about a lawful term of the rabbis. I'll get in a minute. I'm thinking too many things. It's a legal term of the rabbis. When we think of legal in America, in my civics class in the ninth grade, they told us you had three parts of the government. You had the, the executive branch. Well, God is the executive. God. And you have the legislative branch. And you have the judicial branch of government. Now, I don't know why I remember that, but I do. Judicial is the execution. Now, God is the ex one who executes judgment as to whether it's guilty or innocent. Legislative are the people who, who make the laws. And that's also God. An executive is like the king. That's the president of the United States. So that would be the king. <clears throat> and God is the one. The legislature is the senators and the House of Representatives. That's our legislative branch right there. So, but God is the legislative branch. He makes all the laws, doesn't he? Remember the word law, nomos? In the Greek, means legal food for animals. In our case, we are sheep. And God is the one who executes judgment. God is the one who declares guilty or innocent. When the Bible says we're to judge righteous judgment, it's saying that we have to pronounce the judgment of God when the Bible says judge not, that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged, and what measure you meet, it will be measured to you again there in the seventh chapter of Matthew. And then he says, get this beam out of your eye, which is partiality to your friends, or you're partial to yourself. Get the beam out of your eye, so you can see clearly to judge righteous judgment, and to get the moat out of your brother's eye. And the beam has to do with partiality. When you're partial, P-R-O-S-O-P, prosopateo, that is the word partial, or it is the word respect of persons. That's the problem men have. And sometimes the person you respect is yourself. I have an idea and I think I know what's going on here. And you don't unless you know exactly that something has been transgressed. And you have to hear all the evidence. All right. Now, we're talking about how do we judge? What do we judge with? I'm going to go back to where I was last week, we judge, according to Hebrews 1 and 8, we judge with a scepter, well, let's read that, unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now, that word scepter is the word rabdos. Now, if you have a scepter of righteousness, the word righteousness is E-U-T-H-E-T-E-S. That is not the common word righteousness, and that is mentioned one time in the Bible in this verse. And it, is, it comes from the word euthus. E-U-T-H-U-S. Euthus is a construction of U, E-U, meaning well 
or good. And Tithame. Tithame means to level in a passive horizontal posture. What that means, you are passively bowing on your face. I can't hardly do that at my age. But flat face down on your face. If you get face down before God, how do you do that figuratively? How do you bow? How do you have a well leveling? Huh? What? Well, you have a well leveling to God. When you level to the laws of God, what do you do? When you level to God. This is the same thing as the word humble. Humble, T-A-P-E-I-N-O-O. Tepinua means to level self. I like Mr. Vine's definition. He says it means to level, level mountains and hills. I like that because Babylon is a mountain of pride, the scripture says. O oh, thou most proud, I'm going to make you a burnt mountain. He says, I'm going to make you a level mountain. And when we level ourselves, the word mountain is the word horas. Remember, <clears throat> a mountain is a capital city. If you look up Mount in McClinic and Strong, it'll tell you it's a capital city of an empire that rules an empire. David said, Thou hast made my mountain to stand strong, O Lord. And when the Bible speaks of speaking to the mountain of self, there in, in uh, Mark eleven twenty three, the Lord told Ezekiel, in Ezekiel the 36th chapter, go speak to the mountains of Israel. Well, is Ezekiel going out there and going to talk to a bunch of dirt? He's going to walk up to this mountain up here and go, hey, mountain. No, he's talking about the ruling men of Israel, or which are the mountains of Israel, and they've gone after Baal and the grove and Shemash and Molech, and he's telling them, God's going to level you. That is very idiomatic language. So, Tepanua, humble, but remember, you cannot humble, be level to men and God at the same time. Most people think humble. You know what they think humble is? I'm humble. I See, my, I'm pigeon-toed and I'm not neat. I'm just humble. That's not humble. Humble, if you level, the Bible says, humble yourself under the hand of God. What is the hand of the Lord? Does anybody remember? Psalms, the 17th chapter. Deliver me from the wicked, which is thy sword and thy hand. God uses evil men to cut this mountain of self down over the years through fire and trials and persecution to level us. I was very lifted up when I was young. Just, I'm going to be a famous singer and I'm going to be rich and I'm going to be a famous preacher in the world and I'm going to do this and that. And in order for God to humble you, you become bold to men, but you're not always hard and harsh to men. When I get out of the pulpit, I told a fellow the other day, I said, he said, you're awful quiet, um, usually out here in everyday life. I said, yeah, I just am, am on fire in the pulpit. I have a, a intensity in the pulpit. But when I'm out here in the world, I'm just quiet. I talk to people quiet. I witness to them quiet. I'm very gentle with them. I never demand anything of anybody. I'll talk to them about truth. I'll talk to them about sin. If they want to hear it, I just back away from them. And that'll make them angry enough as it is. Did you know that? So when you humble to God, 
eutithame or euthis would be a synonym, a well leveling would be a synonym for humble. When you humble yourself, you're ruling with a rabdos, a scepter of righteousness. Can you see that? Whenever, but you, you can't go out and humble yourself to men if you don't know anything about the Word of God. The more you learn about truth, what you do is you rule people with that. A lot of times if I start talking out in public, I may talk in this tone of voice right here, and I'll say, well, let me tell you about what the Bible says about that. And I may be just talking to somebody. I'll be witnessing to somebody. I, I was out at, I've told this story before, but it's a good illustration of how you witness to somebody. I was picking up some flowers out at a nursery here a few years ago. Me and Mary went over to Jolton to a nursery, and the guys were loading the flowers in my pickup, and and I said, y'all ever see that guy? And I, t I said, just like this, y'all ever see that guy on TV? He's got the chalkboard, and he writes all those Greek words on the board. And, and one of them said, no, and the other said, yeah, I think I've seen him. I said, well, that's me. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I said, what do you think about the message? Well, I don't know that I remember it. I said, let me tell you, let me just give you a little bit of what I teach. I said, Jesus said, and I said, just like this, Jesus said that if you... Don't bear a cross there in Luke fourteen twenty seven. He that beareth not his cross and followeth after me cannot be my disciple. And they're just listening. And the two big fellows and look like they're thirty ish or thirty five and kind of look not tough, but like uh, we are working men, you know, we're out here in this uh, hauling these flowers around and stuff in these big pots. And I said, Jesus said that if you don't bear your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. I said, you know what he was saying? They said, no. I said, he was saying that you can't go to heaven without a daily cross. And I said it just like that. And that's the way I'll say it. I try to be gentle but firm at the same time. Then I said, do you all know what a daily cross is? And they just stood there and went, just shaking their heads like that no I said then you probably don't know where to get one do you and they just shook their heads no real quiet so I began to tell them well the way you get a daily cross is the same place Jesus got his cross he told the truth just like I'm telling you now and it made men angry and they killed him for it now, when you witness to somebody, you have to be tender and gentle but firm. You don't walk up and say, hey, that's sin. You need to quit doing that. It really will hurt somebody if you get real gentle. And some people don't even like that, and they will get furious with you. But you don't have to be mean. What you do is you humble to God. You speak truth to people. I was actually ruling those guys in that conversation because I was saying something they knew nothing about. That's when you rule the scepter of righteousness. Can you see that? Yep. Not a we, huh? We got scepter. Huh? Scepter. <laughs> scepter. Not scepter. Scepter. Scepter of righteousness. All right. It's a scepter, a rabdos. That's how we rule people. I've told the story about the guy went into the real estate office and he'd come out and talking about how great he felt. I said, well, you must have Jesus in your heart. I said it in front of a bunch of real estate agents, a bunch of female real estate agents, and he was trying to show off. And he started cussing when I said, you must have Jesus in your heart. No, blankety, blankety, blank. I said, well, I can tell you you don't have Jesus in your heart by what's coming out of your mouth because of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. It ruled him. He just said, i got to go. And he stomped out. I was ruling him with that scepter. And I said it real gentle to him, but I was firm with him. I knew the guy. I knew he was a boisterous, loud guy. He's an old retired Marine sergeant. And I knew him, and I knew how he was. So I didn't beat around the bush with him. I went, boom. He knew me. He was cussing in front of me. So I'm going to say, I'm going to level you here. 
And I did it in front of those women. And he ran. That's ruling the world with a scepter of righteousness. Can you see that? Let me give you. I'm going to show you something about this word scepter. Rabdos. I believe it is a form of rabbi. Because it is said that the rabbis would bind and loose or pronounce judgment, and that is a scepter. But I had, let me give you something that's really interesting about this scepter. Now, they had many words, and to show you that the translators must have known what they were talking about, let me read to you what a rabbi was. This is out of Kittle's Dictionary of New Testament Greek Words. Rabbi, it means great. Great is a term for someone who occupies a high and respected position. So whenever they would say uh, Herod the Great or they would say uh, Antiochus the Great, it didn't mean, it just meant they were in high position. Also, anybody that was great was called a rabbi. The chief of the guard was called a rabbi. A chief of a guard at the temple or a chief of a guard of any kind was called a rabbi. It means master or teacher. The chief magician was called a rabbi. Officer of his household was called a rabbi or a master. The Lord High Chamberlain was also called a rabbi. My or our great one or Lord is a respectful term of address for the high official by those under him. Someone who was higher in rank than the speaker was called the rabbi. The prince of the people was called a rabbi. The master by the slave, a slave would speak to his master as rabbi. It was a real common term used throughout the culture of the ancient world. The master craftsman by his associates was called a rabbi. The robber captain by his accomplices. Jesse James would have been called rabbi if that had been over there by the man and his gang. <clears throat> also, an occasion on occasion, the prophet Elijah was called rabbi. The Messiah and God were called rabbi. It was a custom for the pupil to address his teacher as rabbi. Lord is a title for the outstanding scribe, and he was called rabbi, or teacher, or master. That was a rabbi. Now, let me tell you about this word rabdos. I was talking to a <clears throat> talking to a uh, Muslim some years ago from New York, and he was fighting me on the word scepter I'm going to give you, show you what these guys do this is very interesting let me tell you about the word rabdos rabdos means a staff or a rod this is now I've said this before that people think they found contradiction in the Bible if they're an atheist and this is this uh, Muslim, of course, he quit being a Muslim and became a Catholic. He was watching me, and he kept calling me about his information. And uh, so he switched. The reason he switched from Muslim, Muslim to Catholic because his father was a Muslim, his mother was a Catholic. But he kept watching me, and he'd call and ask me about things. And he brought up something that most people do not realize because, let me give you some Information or rabdos. It means a stave carried by the gods. Originally, it was a judge's penal rod. We think of a penal institution. A penal rod would be a rod that they would use to pronounce judgment. Uh, you're going to jail. Whatever. Uh, some say, when the Bible says, when the Bible says uh, there in the 49th chapter of Genesis, and Jacob, Israel, or Israel, his name was changed to Israel, 
Jacob was blessing and cursing certain sons upon his deathbed. And he says of, of Judah, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. A scepter was a ruling rod. And they may be setting, and they would say the lawgiver between his feet could have been the scepter, or it could have been a scribe sitting down there taking the notes just like the woman in the courtroom. So it could have been a scepter, and they ruled with the scepter. Now the Bible says we rule with the scepter of righteousness. That's the only time the word righteousness that the word, that's the only place the word euthetes is mentioned. The word righteousness, every other time you find it, is dikaio, D-I-K-A-I-O-S-U-N-E. Dikaio sune. Of course, it comes from D-I-K, I'll get right in a minute, A-I-O, D-I-K-A-I-O-S-U-N-E. That's the common word for righteousness. It comes from D-I-K-A-I-O-O, which means to justify or render innocent. So therefore, even this word would be connected with euthetes, E-U-T-H-E-T-E-S. The way we, we use this scepter of righteousness is by buying to God's will and we're justified and rendered innocent. Now, these words would actually be connected. And that's probably why the translators translated it that way. Now, let me tell you about this rod, this rabdos. It was a staff. It could be a shepherd's staff. Shepherd's staff. Which was a hook. So that the shepherd could reach out and hook one of the baby lambs and bring them back out of a ditch or out of the briars, somewhere like that. It could also be the rod. Rabdos could be a rod. It had hobnails in it. They would cut a, a branch out of the ground, and it would, and they would shave it off and make it into a rod, and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The rod and the staff was called a rabdos. Both of them. Huh? What did I say? A oh, a root out of the ground. They'd pull the root out, shave it off, and have the big part of it, and they would use that rod. When David said, I killed a bear and a lion, now they weren't, they weren't grizzly bears that David was fighting. Probably something like a small black bear, and it wasn't a, a 500 pound lion out of Africa it's probably something like a mountain lion and the migration of all these animals has changed over the thousands of years so they at that time they probably had something like a mountain lion when David said when David went to battle against Goliath and he and Saul puts his Saul puts his armor on him and it weighs him down and David says I have not proven this armor what he means, I have not learned to use this armor in battle. He said, let me take this armor off. I've got this rod. I killed a bear with this. I killed a lion with this. You see this sling? I have knocked out animals, big animals with it. I've proven these. I can handle the giant. He won't get close to me. He's nine foot six. He's lumbering, walking around like this. And David says, I'll go out there running at him. And David ran towards him as fast as he could. That rod was called, that, that rod, that war club was called a rabdos. And the staff was called a rabdos. Let me read a little more. You had many titles for the rabdos. A shepherd's staff. A stick for beating was a rabdos. A staff or reed or wood to measure specific undefined length than in Revelation 11 and 1, when a reed was used to measure, they would take a reed and they, that would be a rule to measure a foundation. They would treat it in some kind of oil 
and it would be straight, and they would measure a, a wall with it to make sure that it was... They would easy, either use a plumb line or use a reed. We find in Revelation, Revelation 11 and 1, we find an angel coming using a reed to measure the foundation of the temple, and we find the, an angel over there in Zechariah 2 and 1 using a reed to measure the temple of God or measure Jerusalem. And it's not talking about literal Jerusalem. It's talking about heavenly Jerusalem, us, and all those that are in heavenly Jerusalem, the church. So you had reeds used, and they were called rabdos. They were called rabdos, and I'm getting to a point here. The rod was a rabdos, and they had any number of things that they called a rabdos. Uh, the rabdos was called, was said to feed, commonly meaning to rule. So whenever the shepherd would be ruling the sheep, he fed the sheep, and the rod was for protecting the sheep so he could feed them. He was called a friend. The shepherd was called the ra'a of the sheep friend. He lived with them. He slept with them. He was out on the plain with them, out in the fields with them. He fought the lion and the bear, and the shepherd was so adept with the sling, David said, I can hit that giant right between the eyes. I have done this. They would sling that sling all day long. I uh, used to make slings out of shoe tongues, old shoe tongues when I was a little kid. I'd give me a leather, two leather strips, and I'd get a, and I'd put a stone in it, if you put a jagged stone in it, it's just like throwing a spitball, except it's a lot worse. If you put a jagged stone in a sling, it'll go... You can't hit anything with it. And I used to do that just to watch it go... Every kind of way, because as it's going through the air, the air is catching it, and just like an airplane wing, making it turn like that. But if you get a smooth stone, it'll go straight. The smoother the stone... The round of the stone, and David said, I have proven this staff and this and this rod, and I've proven this sling. I can hit him right between the eyes and it'll knock him out. That's exactly what happened. David didn't kill Goliath with a sling. He knocked him out with a sling, and then he went up and took Goliath's sword and cut his head off. He killed him with his own sword. The Bible doesn't say he killed him with a sling. Most people think that, but it's not true. Now I'm going to show you something here that's very, very interesting. I had this Muslim called. So you got all kinds of rods. Well, do we have all kinds of rods? Well, yeah. We got a hot rod. We got a lightning rod. Don't we? We got a tie rod. Don't we in a car? We got a fishing rod. You see, people don't think, and this Muslim didn't know there were different kinds of rods. When you use the word rabdos, that could mean any number of things. Something for killing an animal, something for pulling one of them out of a out of a hole, any number it could be a rod for measuring. Or we have a a rod that's a gun. That's what the old gangsters used to call them. Or a hanger rod. One that hangs in your closet to hang your clothes on. Right? All those are rods, but they're not the same one and they don't even look alike, do they? The same goes for a rod and it looks like... I didn't know the answer to tell this guy, but I know it now. Look over here in Matthew 10. Here's the rabdos. Matthew 10. I'm just going to give you this. What we rule with is a scepter of bowing to the will of God. We use to put the world at bay. We learn the truth of God's word. We bow to God's word. We say the truth to people and it makes them run from us. 
That's what's that's what we rule with. Now, but you don't you're not mean with it. You use compassion, gentleness, kindness, tenderness. When I talk to people, I'm always tender to them, tender and gentle to them. I used to raise my voice, but I quit doing that. I've learned that since I've got over sixty something. I don't know what age it was, but I quit doing that. I, I, you don't have to do that. Look over at Matthew 10. Now, Matthew 10, Jesus is telling the apostles. He's sending the apostles out into the world. We're talking about ruling with a rabdos. And he names the apostles. Let's just read a little of this. And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits, which is the same thing as unclean demons, which is the same thing as self, to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. But they didn't have to say, be healed. All they had to do, Paul said, was touch somebody. That's all they had to do. They didn't even have to say, be healed. Now, the names of the twelve apostles are these. Now, if you want the apostles, you can find them in Mark three seventeen, Luke 6 and 12, and right here. Now, the names of the twelve apostles are these, the first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother. And they were fishermen all together on the Sea of Galilee. Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, and the publican. James the son of Alphaeus and Lebius whose surname was Thaddeus. Simon the Canaanite, so there's two Simons there, Simon Peter and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, say, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, not yet until Acts 2. Right? That's when he pours out of his Spirit on all flesh, after he's resurrected. And into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which would be northern Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is here. The word at hand means here. It's here. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Now, Charismatics say, oh, we can do all the things the apostles does. I want to see somebody raise the dead, okay? Not raise the dead somewhere in Africa that we can't find them. Oh, there's been people raised from the dead in Africa. Some guy raised a dead man over there. I want to, I want to see that. Cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses charismatics nor script for your journey and of course jim jones picked up his bible and threw it on the floor and says take no scripture well the script is a food bag it's a little leather food bag that the shepherds carried to carry cheeses and dried figs and dates and so forth nor script for your journey neither two coats neither shoes nor yet staves don't take a rabdos. No rabdos, for the workman is worthy of his meat. No rabdos. Okay? Now, go over here, and this is what the Muslim brought out to me. So, don't take any staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Now, go over here to Mark 6. Now, Mark's giving you his account of Jesus sending the people forth. Mark 6 and verse... Let's look here in verse 7. He called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth by two and two and gave them power over unclean spirits and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey except a staff, a rabdos. Now, he says, don't take a rabdos over there in Matthew. And he says, take a rabdos here. It has to be two different rods. One is for fighting. The other is for walking. A walking stick was called a rabdos as well. You see what I'm saying? 
No script, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals and put on, and not put on two coats. Now, this don't sound like the charismatics, does it? We're supposed to be rich. They say, we're king's kids, and therefore we have to be rich in money. Well, we're going to talk about that, okay? So, and then go over here to Luke 9. Luke 9. He says, take a staff here. But, they, but the translators called it a staff. But it's a rabdos. Now look here in Luke 9. Evidently the translators knew what, the, what Jesus, what God was talking about. And Luke 9, they translated stave. A stave was something during the English times to fight with. A staff was something to walk with. So you got different kinds of rods, just like we do. And that's what the article says in the Kittles. You had different titles for rods. You had a walking staff, and you had a fighting staff, fighting stave. Look here in Luke, the ninth chapter. I just thought this would be interesting to you. The ninth chapter and the third. Let's read down to three. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and cure diseases and sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves, rabdos. But he says, Take a rabdos over in Mark, did, didn't he? The translators translated it staff in Mark 6, 8, but translated a staff was for walking in English times when they translated this, and a stave was for fighting with. So the translators evidently knew what God was talking about. No staves, no fighting rod, but a walking rod. Can you see the difference there? Nor script and so forth. So I thought I would give you that. Now let's look at a couple of these. In Hebrews 1 and, 1 and 8, scepter of righteousness. It's also a ruling, a ruling rabdos. And look down here, look in, look in Hebrews 9, so you have to know what kind of a rod he's talking about, don't you? Go over here to Hebrews 9, and here's another example of a rabdos, which was used by a rabbi, or it could also be used by someone who's defending themselves against a charging line like David did. Thy rod and thy staff. The rod and the staff were both called a rabdos. Can you see that? One was for fighting and one was for rescuing the sheep. Look here in Hebrews, the ninth chapter. And this is giving a description. So in case you ever run across a Muslim that tries to challenge you, that'll help you. Okay? Knowing there's different kinds of rod just like there is with us. Right? A fishing rod is not a tie rod, <laughs> is it? If your tie rod goes out, your car gets to getting out all shaky and getting out of joint, you know, and your tires wear out. And a, and a fishing rod is not a hot rod. That's a 34 Ford all souped up with the fenders taken off of it and, and with a 327 57 Chevy engine put in it. That's a hot rod. Board and stroke, okay? Okay, it's not hot dog either. So, look here in Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. Here's a rabdos. 9 in verse 3. After the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. So he's talking about, he's talking about the inner sanctuary inner sanctuary, behind the veil, inside the Ark of the Covenant, had three items in it. He tells you right here what they are. Which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the golden censer was a censer that they took coals off the altar out here. Some writers say they, that the high priest would put it between the cherubim 
and it had the coals of the altar, he would take the he'd take the incense off the altar of incense and sprinkle it on there so it would cloud up that inner area because the priest could not see uh, Jehovah God sitting on the throne. If he did, he'd die. Which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid round with gold, wherein inside the Ark of the Covenant was the golden pot that had manna. In memory or in remembrance of the manna they were fed in the wilderness. And Aaron's rabdos, that budded. Well, that's not a fighting rod. Well, I could be, I guess. It could have been a fighting rod or a shepherd's rod. And there in the 17th chapter of uh, Numbers, uh, Leviticus, uh, Moses said, bring, bring me 12 rods, one for each tribe in Israel, and for Levi, bring me a, the rod of Aaron, and we're going to lay them out here, and the one that buds, these are dead rods, dead rabdos, and the one that resurrects from the dead will be my high priest. And Aaron's started shooting buds out. That's why Aaron's rod budded, to show resurrection. And he says, And Aaron's rod that budded in the tables of the covenant, or the Ten Commandments, were inside there. So that's a rabdos. Look here in... Look at Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11... Look at verse 21. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, in the 48th chapter of Genesis, and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his rabdos, his staff. So that wasn't a staff for fighting, <laughs> He was worshiping God as he was leaning upon his support staff. And they would call bread. They would call the sustenance sustenance means food and what it takes. They called the entire uh, substance of Israel for their well-being in the food that they needed, they called that the staff of bread. The staff of bread meant when God would say, I'm going to break your staff of bread, it means I'm going to destroy your food in Israel. That was the rabdos of bread. That's very figurative language about their sustenance for staying alive. So, the word rabdos had many meanings. Can you see that? Let me give you another instance of this. Look over here. So, this is what we rule with, except we rule with a rod. That's why he had to stipulate which rod it was in Hebrews. In Hebrews 1 and 8, he didn't say we the scepter of God's kingdom is a scepter. He says it. He had to stipulate which rabdos it was. He said it's not a rabdos of beating uh, some animal with. It's not a rabdos for measuring with. It is a staff of euthus or euthetes. E u t h e t e s. He was stipulating which rod it was in Hebrews one and eight. Do you understand what I'm saying? Which rod? It wasn't. It was the rod for ruling, bowing, and leveling to the will of God. Now look here in. So he leaned upon his rabdos. Look over here in Revelation two. Look at Revelation two. But you've got different kinds of rods, don't you? Different kinds of rabdos. Revelation two. And verse 27. Well, let's read a little before that. Look at verse 26. Now, he's talking to the different churches. Uh, he's talking to, when he just spoke to Pergamos just before this, now he's talking to Thyatira. 
the church at Thyatira. These are seven churches of Asia. Asia Minor, which was Western Turkey, is what they called Asia. Western Turkey. Now look here in verse 26. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Now, overcometh, remember, is the word nike, anikao, N-I-K-A-O. That's the word overcometh. Overcometh is a verb. The noun which of which this is a verb form is the word nike, which is the word victory. I, pro, I, I feel that's where they got the word Nike, that if you put on Nike shoes, Michael Jordan's Nike shoes, that you can win. You get the victory. You can outplay. You can be five foot uh, seven like me and uh, be short and 75 years old, but if I put on some Nikes, I can outshoot Michael Jordan, right? And I'll get the victory. Well, what is the victory that overcomes the world? We'll go over there and look at it in 1 John. We're going to come back over here. 1 John, back up through Jude, to 1 John, the fifth chapter. First John, the fifth chapter, verse 4. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh, nikao, that's the verb form of victory. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world. The word victory is nike, overcometh is nikao, the verb form. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Death to self. Death to self. Overcomes or has victory. Wouldn't that have to do with judging righteously, bind and loose? Wouldn't it? When we bind and loose, we rule with the scepter of righteousness and we overcome the world whenever I've talked to people in public and I have more truth than they have a lie and they don't have any answers they'll run away from me and that's the scepter of righteousness of leveling to the will of God can y'all see how figurative this is you don't have to beat people up just be firm with the word of God and just say the truth I don't always witness to everybody because sometimes there, it's like there's a brick wall there and I can't get through. Y'all know what I'm talking about? There's just, it's like God doesn't want me to witness to those people. A witness real easy. I'll say something real simple, real quiet. I'll just be real gentle. I never raise my voice. I used to. Don't anymore. I just say the truth. I don't want to hear that. Okay, I won't give it to you. Excuse me, please. I walk away. If they, if their eyes all of a sudden, I'm going through all this stuff, and they go, get that dead look in their eye. I know they're not interested, and I just cut it off. Go. You can, t after a while, you get to where you know where, if you're getting somewhere or not. But you're still ruling them because they don't have any words to say. They have no defense. We rule them with a scepter of righteousness, with the sword of the Lord. And the word of God is quick and powerful and more sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and the joints of mar and the, ma the marrow. It'll actually make a man's knees shake. That's what it means, the joints and the marrow. The bones will shake. And he's now... So he says, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And back to Revelation, he says, the man that overcomes and keeps my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod, a rabdos of iron. The iron is God's word. 
As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to pieces. You know what happens to people? Broken to pieces. Remember, break in pieces and scatter abroad. Now think of this. I want you to think of this. When you break something in pieces and scatter it, break, God says, I will break these words these languages in pieces there, these languages, I will confuse them and I will scatter them throughout the earth and you find scattering all through the Old Testament where God says, I'll scatter. We're talking about this, that this coming Sunday morning. When they make themselves a name, when a person comes up to you and they've made themselves a name, or they made themselves an authority. Shem is the word name in the Hebrew. Onoma is the word name in the, in the Greek. And when you make yourself a name, you have to say, Lord, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed is the word hagiazo, H-A-G-I-A-Z-O. It's the same word as sanctify. Lord, sanctify your name, your authority in my life. Get rid of my name, my authority. Get rid of my doctrine. When you say name, you're just talking about an authority. It's your imagination. The world is full of imagination. I'm accused by people. I've been accused by people's imagination. It's your imagination. And what they have is an opinion. And they do not have two witnesses. Opinion. O-P-I-N-I-O-N. I just get to write and I keep on writing. <laughs> you have to have two witnesses that are privy and see the offense and know the offense. When you say, Hagiadzo, Lord, get rid of my opinions. Hagiadzo means to cause to be holy. Hagios. Pure. Give me pure understanding, Lord. Now, so, break in pieces goes with scattering abroad and confusing. God says, when you level to my will, and you have this scepter of euthetase, you're leveling to my will, you will destroy the enemy with God's word. It don't mean you'll beat him in the head, literally. But if you have the word of truth with you, men can't stand under it. I never get angry anymore. If somebody talks to me, I tell them the truth. I just say, here's the truth. What you need to do is deal with it. If they don't want to deal with it, I say, excuse me, I've got something else to do. Now, what you will do, you will destroy men's imaginations. You can't believe how much imagination people have. When they attack me and the Word, they're usually just imagining it. They're imagining things. That has to do with Babylon, doesn't it? That has to do with pulling down strongholds, doesn't it? Pulling down strongholds. And the stronghold means a castle. That means a castle... And the original castle was Babylon, wasn't it? They said, we can't be conquered. Yeah, they could. They said they couldn't, but they can. And he says, you'll break in pieces. He says, the man that overcomes by faith, by death to self, he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. It's not talking about a literal breaking. You break their mind. You break their thinking. 
you break up everything that they have assaulted you with, with the truth. Even as I received of my Father, and I will give this person the morning star. The morning star is Christ over there in the 22nd chapter of, of Revelation. And the morning star, the rabbi said, was the Pleiades, and they said it in the spring it brought up the, the sap and the vine and gave the fruit to the fields. We have the fruit of the Spirit, and we have the morning star, which is Christ. And you're going to rule people with this rod. I hope you can see that. But what you pull down, let's go back over there to... Well, let me give you a couple other verses here first on the rod. Look at Hebrew. Look at Revelation 11. Revelation 11. Let me go ahead and read this so you'll see it. Verse, chapter 11, verse 1. There was given unto me a reed like unto a rod, like a rabdos. But the reed was a calamos, K-A-L-A-M-O-S. A kalamos was a measuring stick. And it was like a rabdos. But this is a rabdos for measuring. This is not a rabdos for beating a wild animal with. It's a different rabdos. It's like the difference between a fishing rod and a hot rod. It's not the same thing. There was given to me a reed like a rabdos, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship there. And what is the temple of God now? When John wrote this in 96 A.D., in 33 A.D., when Jesus was crucified, Jesus crucified... He, all the rituals of the temple were nailed to the cross with Christ, and then we become the temple of God. We become spiritual Israel, spiritual Jew. So the temple he's measuring, when you measure, what do you measure? What are you measuring for? You're measuring a boundary, aren't you? And what would be the boundary of God? What's the word for boundary? Horizo. Horizo means to bound. It means to bound. Actually, horizo, no H's, but just a diacritical mark, a breathing sound. It's our word horizon. It means to bound inside the light. Bound in the light. So, what's being measured here is the temple of God. The temple of God is in Jerusalem, isn't it? And the Bible says we're come to Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, the church. The church, so this is measuring the church, isn't it? Huh? Yep. It couldn't be measuring literal Jerusalem because look at the same chapter. And you got two witnesses down here. And the two witnesses have to do with judging righteously or binding and loosing, doesn't it? The two witnesses of Revelation are the same two witnesses in the Old Testament in Numbers 35, Leviticus 17, Levitic, uh, excuse me, Deuteronomy 17, Deuteronomy 19. It takes two witnesses to declare anything in Israel. The two witnesses are the priest and the king. God hath made us priest and king, and the Bible says that the two witnesses in Zechariah the fourth chapter are the two anointed ones in Israel, and there were two anointed in Israel. They were anointed by the prophet, and that was the priest and the king, and king, priest and king. And God hath made us priests and kings, and we're the witnesses. Priest offers acceptable sacrifice. Kings declare righteous judgment. So, you got the two witnesses in this chapter, don't you? Declaring the righteous judgment of God upon the world. Well, let me read this, read the rest of this. Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar 
and them that worship therein. We're worshiping in the temple of God, aren't we? In this temple. This is very abstract language. But the court which is outside the temple, leave out. What he's saying, measure the church inside the temple of God. And there was a court outside the temple. That was the court of the Gentiles. He's talking about spiritual Gentiles, which are evil men. Now, there's a Gentile church, but we're spiritual Jews, spiritual Israel. The Jew is not above the heart. So he's talking about here, leaving the unbelieving vessels of wrath out. And measure not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty-two months, or a time, time, and dividing of times, or twelve hundred sixty days. And I don't have time to go into that right now. But the reason we know he's not measuring the literal temple is because it has been destroyed. The temple was destroyed by Titus in 70 A.D. He can't be measuring the literal temple. It's destroyed. This is 96 A.D. The temple is us. He's saying, measure who is inside the horizo. pro horizo is the word predestinate. Measure who's predestined inside the temple, right? Y'all see that? And we know it's not a literal temple or a literal Jerusalem. That's been buried by Titus, the Roman general, the son of Vespasian in 70 A.D. He can't be talking about a literal temple because if you look on later in that chapter, he speaks of what, was, what he called, what John called literal Jerusalem. Look in verse 8. Speaking of the two witnesses, which is the church throughout the world, you and I, the priest and the king, and their dead bodies, verse 8, shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Literal, literal Israel is called Sodom and Egypt. That can't be the temple being measured in verse 1, can it? He's not saying measure that temple. And look at a corresponding chapter in Zechariah 2. Go to Zechariah 2. When in Zechariah, Israel is in, is in captivity in Babylon. And Zechariah is saying, come out of Babylon, Israel. Deliver yourself. Look in Zechariah, the second chapter. Verse 1, I lifted up mine eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. He had a rabdos in his hand too. Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said unto me, To measure Jerusalem. Well, how can he be measuring Jerusalem? This is in... Now look. How can he be measuring literal Jerusalem for the same reason he couldn't have been measuring little Jerusalem over there in Revelation 11, because this is in 520 B.C. Now notice, in 586 B.C., Jerusalem and the temple was leveled to the ground by Nebuchadnezzar. Look at this. He can't be talking about a literal city. Jerusalem has always been God's people. Look. It can't be talking about a literal Jerusalem. At the time Zechariah is prophesying, he's living over there where Jerusalem is, where it used to be. The, the city has been destroyed, leveled to the ground by Nebuchadnezzar. And when they would destroy a city, they would come in, pull down every building, burn everything that was standing. They would plow. They'd take a plow and plow it up and sow salt in it so nothing would grow there. And that's what they did to Jerusalem. Now, how could he be measuring Jerusalem when it's a wasteland in 520? And Jerusalem has, is not going to be rebuilt until 444, when Nehemiah gets a decree from Artaxerxes, I'll just put art, to rebuild the city. While Zechariah is preaching, the city's not rebuilt and it's been destroyed. 
He can't be talking about measuring a literal city, can he? Huh? He's talking about the people who are the believers. The same thing he's talking about in Revelation 11 and 1. You see what I'm saying? If you don't see it, say, I don't understand. I'm give, this is real simple. This is real simple. In 96 A.D., John is writing Revelation, and Jerusalem had been destroyed in 70 A.D. When Zechariah's prophesying in 520 B.C., Jerusalem had been destroyed here, just like here, after it had been rebuilt. And it's not going to be rebuilt till 444. So when Zechariah's prophesying, there is no literal Jerusalem. No Jerusalem. When John is prophesying, there is no Jerusalem. You understand what I'm saying? Y'all get that? He can't be talking about measuring a literal town. We're heavenly Jerusalem, the church. So when he's talking about measuring Jerusalem, in Revelation 11 and 1, he's talking about measuring those who are in the boundary in the Horizzo. Those who have been predestined, pro Horizzo, predetermined for the boundary of light. That's what he's talking about. Y'all see that? It's not possible for him to be talking about a literal Jerusalem in either place. Because the Jerusalems had been burned to the ground. Huh? I hope I've... I keep getting this blank look. You understand that? Now, he says, Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof. He's not talking about a literal city. He's talking about the people. And the people are over in Babylon at this point. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him and said unto him, Run, speak to this man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls. Towns without walls. He's talking about a spiritual Jerusalem. There was no such thing as a town without walls back then. It was a town that had walls. How's Jerusalem a town without walls? It's the people, because watch what he says. For the multitude of men and cattle therein, for I say the Lord will be unto them a wall of fire. A wall of fire about me, I have nothing now to fear. With his manna he must hungry, so shall fill lily the valley. A wall of fire about me. That'll be the wall. It's protecting us, isn't it? A wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of Jerusalem. Well, there's no glory in the middle of Jerusalem back then. It's to the ground and most of the people did not come back. And they've been scattered for 2,600 years. Ho, ho, which is a cry of woe. Come forth and flee from the land of the north. The north was Babylon. He's saying, Jerusalem, you're in Babylon. Come out of there. You've gotten decrees to come back. Why are you staying? They were having fun and owning land there. They were wealthy in Babylon. For I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heaven, saith the Lord. Now watch what he says in the next verse. Deliver thyself, O Zion. Zion is the mountain where Jerusalem sits. Is he talking about, okay, you're over in Babylon. There's a hill over in Babylon. It's called Zion. It's made out of dirt. I'm telling that dirt mountain to get back over where you belong in Israel. Now, I'm being ridiculous. He's not talking to a dirt mountain. He's talking to the people, isn't he? That's as much a metaphor as the first verse. You see that? Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. You're in Babylon. Get out of there. You've gotten decrees, one in 538, to come back and rebuild the temple. You got one in 520, and sometime, and right about this time, somewhere around 518, maybe 519 or 518, Zechariah's prophesying. He started in 520. He started in the second year of Darius, the Bible says. Second year of Darius. 
And Darius started, that's when Zechariah started preaching. And Darius ascended the throne in 522 B.C. So it was in 520 when he started preaching. And he's saying, get out of there. You've got two decrees that tells you to leave and go home. So when he's talking to Zion, he's not talking to a mountain of dirt. You've got to stay with figurative language. Do you see that? Now, let me, let's go back over here because this goes with it. Go back to where we were last week in 2 Corinthians 10th chapter. When you judge righteously, you bind and loose. 2 Corinthians Second Corinthians. Ten. Now remember, this was a favorite of the this is a favorite verse. I'm not getting to I'm not getting to two different subjects like I thought I was going to. Uh, this is a favorite verse of the Charismatics and Pentecostals. They talk about we're gonna bind strongholds, loose pull down stronghold, whoa. I'm just going to review this. How much time do I have, Mike? Man, I'm not, I'm not even getting all of this. I hope you can see this thing about Rabdos. There's many things called a Rabdos. And a master wielded one. But remember, a rabbi was a captain of the guard. He was the head of the gang. He was the, he was the master. Rabbi means master or teacher. So, 2 Corinthians, verse 4. You hear the Charismatics and Pentecostals quote this verse, and they go, whoopee, we're pulling down strongholds. They think, you know what they think pulling down strongholds is? Playing the organ real loud. Rocking for Jesus. Ha, ha, ha. We're pulling down strongholds. Whoa. That's what they think it is. It's dumb and ridiculous. Have y'all seen them do that? Whew. It's crazy. And they say the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Well, carnal is the word sarkikos. It means fleshly. It's not a real sword. It's not a real club. It's a scepter of righteousness. Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, then would my servants have a sword or a rabdos and fight. But they don't have because it's not of this world. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That's the word akuroma, A-C-H-O-R-A-C-H-U-R-O-M-A. A-C-H-U-R-O-M-A. That's the word Stronghold, it means a castle. Something that's fortified. Something that holds safely. The first fortification in the Bible was Babylon when they said, let us build us a city and a tower. A tower was, the word tower, migdal, means a pulpit or a rostrum. Now what they were saying, we'll build us a great tower. And these towers will preach to the world our power. Migdal is the word. Migdal means a rostrum. A rostrum, this is a rostrum right here. It's called an electron or a rostrum. It's somewhere where you stand and you preach from or it is a throne where you rule from. And we rule with the scepter of righteousness by preaching and teaching the truth of God's Word. Now, here's the pulling down of strongholds, casting down. When you have an imagination and you think you have the truth, 
and you're not absolutely positive, you need to shut your mouth. Quit. Most people, they put their mouth in gear before they think. They got their foot in their mouth up to their knee. They got the cleanest leg in town. Watch out what you're doing. It's your imagination. Casting down imaginations, that's exactly what was happening at Babylon. The Bible says, they said, let us make up our own doctrine. It'll be our opinion, our imagination. There will not be any two witnesses to it. We'll be imagining our opinion and casting that imagination every high or lofty thing. Hope Soma elevated. We spoke of the lofty will be brought low last week. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. If you exalt yourself against gnosis, Anytime you have an opinion that's not verifiable by the Word of God, you have an imagination. And God says, when you have that in Babylon, Babylon was founded on self, let us make us a name. God says, I'll break in pieces their words with a rabdos of righteousness, and I'll scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. When a person gets scattered abroad doesn't mean that you're going to be broken literally into little bitty pieces of flesh out here on the ground. It means your mind and your thoughts and your actions will break and you'll be going every direction in the world except right. Everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought, every noema, everything in your mind to obedience of Christ. Sometimes people think they're obeying Christ because they imagine things. They have imagined the truth. They think they know it, and they're just involved in imagination. And having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled, do you look on things after the appearance? Are you looking at prosopon, which is a form of prosopoliteo? Prosopon means the face, P-R-O-S-O-P-O-N. It comes from the word P-R-O-S-O, prosopoliteo, which is the word respect of persons. Prosopon means the face. It means to look at the exterior instead of way down deep inside and find out the truth. If, they, if, if any man trusts to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. I was going to read to you. Do I have any time, Mike? Whew. I was going to read to you about Babylon. I don't have time to read it. Uh, I was going to read all about the walls and the... Let me read this to you. Talking about a fortification, that is what the word stronghold means. A fortification is a fort, a fortress, fence city, castle, stronghold, mound, or trench. The walls, towers, and gates represented on Egyptian monuments through dating back to a period of 15 centuries before the Christian era bear evidence of advanced state of fortifications and Babylon was the first fortification built by man, Genesis 11. It was their imagination they were involved in. When a man exalts himself against knowledge, he's absolutely sure that he's got the truth I've talked to Baptists that believe they're absolutely sure that they accepted Christ and prayed a sinner's prayer. And they didn't. Let me just read this to you. The wall of a city, Coma, was sometimes double or triple, successfully girding a rocky elevation 
And building a city originally meant the construction of the wall. God said he'll be a wall of fire. And that's what makes us the city of Jerusalem. The gate of a city originally single, single formed a kind of citadel and was the strongest part of all the defense. Because the city, the gate of a city, if the wall come up here like this, the gate of the city was real thick. And they would conduct business there, and they would have, they would sell different items there. They had a sheep gate in Jerusalem where they sold sheep. They would conduct business. It was like a, it was like a city hall. They had a, a dung gate. They had a fish gate. At the various gates of the city, when you wanted to buy those particular things, you went to the gate of the city. That was the last thing to go down in an attack. When the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, it's talking about this right here. But it's figurative language. That was the very last thing to go down. And remember Nehemiah, in the first chapter of Nehemiah, his brothers came to Babylon where he was and they said the gates of the city of Jerusalem are burned to the ground. That meant it was utterly destroyed and that broke Nehemiah's heart. That's when he went to Artaxerxes and said can I have a decree to go and rebuild my city and my homeland. And Nehemiah was over here in Babylon and he went 650 miles over there and began rebuilding. Started in 444 took him 12 years to build the wall of the city. Whew. That was when the city was finished. In the gate of the city originally single formed a kind of citadel and it was the strongest part of defense. It was the armory of the community and the council house of all the authorities. Sitting in the gate was and still is synonymous with possession of power. The Lord told Jeremiah, go to the gates of the city and preach to everybody. Not only will you get the strangers coming in, you'll have the mayor there and the governor there. Tell them to repent that Nebuchadnezzar's coming. And still is synonymous with the possession of power. Even now, there is commonly in the fortified gate of a royal palace in the east, on the floor above the doorway, a council room with a kind of balcony. They had a council room in there with a balcony that looked down over it. So when you came to a city, you got right involved immediately with government, with city hall. And that was the last thing to go down was the gates. The tower, Sirach, was another fortification of the earliest date, being often the citadel or the last retreat when a city was taken, they would go to the tower. You see that in them old Robin Hood movies. They go to the tower when they're being attacked. I've run out of time. I didn't get to all... I'm going to get to Babylon. But if you notice how much detail there is in correcting all this error, it's just... Whew, people just don't... They just don't study. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for truth. Thank you for your word. Deal with our hearts. Crush us under your hand. I pray for the flock. You'll humble the sheep. Humble them before you. Mature them in the faith. Lord, we pray for all who, who are wandering off. There's so many here that are not strong. I pray you'll give them strength. Lead us to your elect family. In Christ's name we pray, amen. kind of interesting about the Rabdos, isn't it? I'm going to hang this up on the wall over here. Is there any tape? I'm going to hang it up under that and over there. Lord, we pray you'll heal my heart. It needs a bow job.